My name is Jamila Marcus and I'm here to introduce the talk Experiment Driven Lockpicking. This has been delivered at Hacker Hotel 2023. We have a recording but the introduction is missing so that's why I'm recording this part separately. I'm the secretary of the open organization of lockpickers. That's a tool with three O's. We are a group of uh, lock pickers, lock collectors, lock researchers, and we dive deep into physical security topics. We deliver presentations uh, like these, and we also uh, publish papers or write uh, blogs about it. The goal of this presentation is to not, not just to share, share this information, not just to share my research, but also to inspire other people to do uh, research as well. So what is this, um, so what is this about? Uh, we are going to talk about uh, site channel analysis. Uh, this is a terminology borrowed from the cryptographic uh, world where we um, measure power, electromagnetic radiation and a few of these things and use statistical means to crack cryptography. But the concept can be applied to a lot of different things. It is just how does information uh, flow, how, does, how is information leaked? And we want to apply this uh, to locks. So for example in locks we can measure uh, resonance frequencies, we can measure rotation angles or we can just observe what type of lock it is. There a lot of different ways. Uh, some are subtle, some are not so subtle. So let me just start with a few that are not very subtle. So here we have a box which contains locks and it is at the trash. So this box has a number on it, the number corresponds with the key. We can make more keys with this. This is information leakage, but it's not very subtle. Already a lot um, better is where we um, look through the keyway of the lock and then observe that this first pin has a few rips on there. And we can already use this information to, to reduce the uh, total um, key combinations from maybe tens of thousands to a couple of thousands. This is useful and we use it a lot but it's still uh, so, so, but it's still not as subtle um, as the things I want to present uh, now. So for the first part of the presentation I wanted to use the rotation of the core and to determine the uh, with the rotation the, the state of the pins inside of the lock. We already use this concept of course for uh, lock picking spools. We also use it a bit in impressioning and other opening methods. But in this case I wanted to try to figure out from just rotation and inserting fake keys into the lock if I can uh, determine the state of the lock. Let me start the, the video and um, hope you like it. ...of the lock. We use it to pick locks. Uh, we use it to determine if we have file too deep with impressioning. This is quite, um, quite normal. But I wanted to see if I can uh, use this information to actually determine the state the pins are in. And therefore with testing multiple keys in the lock 
to determine uh, what the uh, key should be, what the actual key should be. Again, to um, lock picking slides, I've here uh, just a normal, uh, <laughs> normal pins. They don't have any speci special features. They are just round uh, cylinders. And if they're well made, then they don't, um, they work very well in the lock and they don't give much uh, rotation. Like the circle cannot rotate a lot if it's in the first state. And of course, if you lift it to the correct height, then it can rotate. Quite early on, um, when people start picking locks, they already are like, okay, but what are then the defense features uh, locks have? And they have uh, pins like these. These are spool pins, uh, or at least the uh, driver pin, the blue pin is a spool pin. And as you can see on the first uh, image, it is already rotated somewhat. And when we pick locks, then we use this rotation uh, to determine uh, where we want to place our lock pick. Because if we lift the pin, it has to righten first. Then the pin is set to the correct height and it can ro rotate uh, more. This is definitely not a new, new thing. Uh, one such tool to exploit this uh, beyond just normal lock picks is uh, this one. It's called a, a Lishi. Uh, this one is uh, made by a Cocolitos. Uh, that's a friend from France. Uh, but these tools have been around for 20, 30 years. Uh, I don't know the exact uh, date. And it has some interesting uh, stories with high-end uh, burglaries where the forensic people couldn't really figure out what the opening method should be, <laughs> and then they figured out that it should be uh, a lock, uh, lock tool like this. The principle of operation is you have a key blank. You have it hollowed out, you replace the, uh, the places for each pin with a wire, and we insert this tool into the lock, and then we find where the first standard pin is. Like it works best for locks with one standard pin and then the rest spool pins. Usually we know where these are, like they are uh, always on the first position, uh, for example. We put a bit of torque on the tool and we push up one pin, the pin with the st standard driver pin then we can feel there's a lot more rotation. So we start to wiggle the tool uh, left and right. And then we can push each pin <laughs> one by one. And you should feel the wobble to become less and less and less until it's a shear line. And then it, it's more and more. And then you just rinse and repeat until you have all the pins set. It's uh, definitely a clever way uh, to, to do this. Uh, these a fancy way of saying we're not looking at the two pulses, but we're looking at each flank of the pulses. And then it's a 20,000 count. So for these experiments, this was enough. <laughs> but for other experiments, you might even want to go uh, beyond this. And then we have a cylinder that I modified. And I modified it in such a way uh, doubles as a follower for the uh, for the lock, so it was very easy to uh, repin the lock <laughs> because I just slid forward uh, the core, put a new pins, slid it back. Then the experiment was to uh, use for every key, for every uh, test test key, measure the for every pin type. <laughs> 
<laughs> measure the rotation. And then there are um, repeated um, experiments with different types of pins, different types of uh, driver pins, and uh, always uh, more locks. These, these experiments can get quite out of hand, like uh, the theory uh, sounds simple, uh, but at some point you're testing uh, hundreds of different uh, scenarios in different configurations. But it was definitely uh, worth it, and it was definitely nice to see uh, graphs like these. This is just a simplified graph, but it should get you uh, the idea. On the x-axis, we have the test key number, and on the uh, y-axis, we have the rotation um, measured. And I've limited the rotation to a 2K, so we can see the, the small bumps uh, on the right hand. And what this shows very nicely is if I overlap these, <laughs> then it shows that no matter which key plus pin combination, I always get the same uh, rotation of the driver pin. So that was, um, I was very happy with this result. But there is definitely still uh, something to do to make this uh, a usable uh, exploit. Just some numbers, uh, the base angle of a of a standard pin is around two and a half degrees, and a spool <coughs> is about uh, seven degrees. So there's definitely uh, some room uh, to measure, but it's not uh, it's not a lot. What I didn't do yet <laughs> is to uh, work out the the mathematics and to find a s efficient uh, search algorithm. And lastly, uh, now I measured inside of the lock, <laughs> uh, and of course you want to have this done outside of the lock. What doesn't help is when rebooting the <laughs> this project, I blew up the encoder. So that was quite an um, expensive uh, mistake. But I since have found new encoders from, from China, and they seem to work uh, fine. Just some distractions in this project. I uh, built uh, a few jigs uh, like these. And I was trying to see if I can efficiently measure keys. Because if I'm going to test 100 keys into a lock, then I better do it efficiently instead of using calipers and measuring the key one by one. Uh, these are uh, DIY uh, sliding potentiometers. And uh, I found it worked, it didn't work very well. If I have a couple hundred euros, then I will definitely buy uh, real, uh, real sliding potentiometers, but they are just expensive. And even the ones uh, that, that you can buy for uh, 100 or 200 euros <laughs> uh, might not be the ones that, I, that work for this project. So that's why I didn't do it yet. Another distraction <laughs> is I built a collection of uh, pins. So I took apart uh, over 50 locks, <coughs> put these uh, pins into nice acrylic uh, enclosures. The, these enclosures are made for, um, some use them for the jewelry, others use them for the um, coin collecting. And then there are uh, la laser cut uh, inserts in them. Uh, the pictures of these are all uh, online if you want them. So we were just looking at uh, just a pin tumbler lock, and this technique might also work on more locks uh, like these. This is um, a disc detainer from Rosengrantz. It's a safety safety deposit box lock. And why it would work is, even though it has many different, uh, many different disks, all of them have uh, cutouts around them. 
and there's one deep cutout, which we call the true gate, and there are several that are, uh, which we consider false gates. So if I can uh, rotate a key into this lock uh, and measure the angle, then I might be able to determine uh, what it should be. And why I like this lock in particular is because I had a very big bunch of them, like in the, in the hundreds of these locks. And I recently uh, found someone else <laughs> with over 100 uh, spare keys. Uh, actually, like more like uh, 10 kilograms of these keys. So I got a few kilograms of these keys. Um, and I have already nice experiments, uh, but nothing I can show uh, right now. So for the next experiment, um, I have here a, a Bowley rotus error. This might be a um, fairly unknown uh, lock, but this was the first uh, iteration of the Bowley. The Bowley is a um, lock company in Canada, and they have currently, I don't know where they are at, at uh, production-wise, but they are not as common <laughs> as any, uh, any other brand. Uh, but they will get there, and they have definitely nice ideas, and I'm uh, wishing them uh, the best there. So for this particular key, it uh, curves backwards. So <laughs> the whole idea is if you cannot reach the pins, then you cannot pick it. That's, of course, not true. Uh, there are two people that uh, have made the tools, spent the time, made the tools, and got it to work. <laughs> But, they, but they're definitely um, having the ideas. The Rotosera is the uh, latest edition for d from their uh, designs. That is the key on the, on the right. It's a lot smaller. <laughs> it's therefore also a lot harder to uh, attack. But uh, if the slides are back... <laughs> So if you insert the, the key into the lock the, and rotate, then you have to press it further into the lock before it can rotate all the way. So it comes a bit uh, manual and it takes some uh, fiddling with, uh, with it. So that might therefore not be uh, the best uh, lock, but it's definitely a nice uh, concept. This is a screenshot from uh, the operational uh, video for from their uh, website. But what I figured out quite quickly, just looking at uh, reviews of the log, uh, just looking at first production uh, prototypes, it was like, it makes sounds. It is quite as if you have sand in the log or something. It doesn't sound very nice, but that's how it, <laughs> how it sounded uh, to me. And I was like, maybe you can use this to decode the lock um, by, uh, by sound. This is then the lock uh, taken apart. And here we have uh, the disks. It's a disk detainer, and we have it positioned on the key. And there is a nice wide uh, cutout on the top which the sidebar uh, drops into. So to figure out how to uh, decode this lock with sound, I need more keys. And of course, you can just go to the company and say, hey, I would like uh, another 100 of your locks. But given they are expensive, um, I just went uh, the 3D printing route. I'm definitely not the expert on key 3D printing, uh, but I definitely believe that any lock that is just a piece of metal, given enough effort, can be uh, made any other way. Either someone is going to machine them, someone is going to print them. Like, this is just an inherent uh, vulnerability of, the, of, of a key. 
this of course does take effort and how much effort I will show hopefully show you in just a second the um, the files do work <laughs> like here we I have a resin print uh, from uh, Walter Walter Belgers um, and it definitely works I send him like five different uh, models and just one of them it just worked that was uh, very nice but I don't have a resin printer so I went the FDM printing route and this was quite a challenge but it was definitely a nice one and but eventually I got it to work so I tried a lot of different things I uh, started with uh, the uh, how do I print this key um, how does this key even fit in in the lock and what I ended up doing was to make small iterations so if I have a uh, let's say the diameter of the whole circle would be a centimeter then I iterate over from 0 0.9 to 1.1 millimeters print all of them test them <laughs> rinse and repeat and after uh, a hundred something keys I got it to work with uh, with FDM printing as well uh, funny thing there is the key um, the key head I offset it by a couple degrees so it would lay flat on the printing bed so it's just one of these uh, dumb <laughs> dumb things that eventually worked. So the next thing is to build a, a jig, like the one here from uh, Technic Lego, and it has a servo motor uh, to rotate uh, the key into the lock. And yeah, this was quite quite fun. Um, I, I built this in uh, in a weekend or something. And then I drive it from uh, from a few Python scripts. But even though the, um, I have different keys, I can make a lot of different keys. I can make uh, I can rotate them in in the cylinder. Then you get sound plots uh, like these. This is just a random one, but it just shows like one of them uh, where I laid up laid a lot of traces on top of each other <laughs> but they're all different and I'm not that good yet at the statistical part and to figure out uh, how to get from this to a uh, working key there are definitely some um, issues that I didn't face uh, before or that I didn't think of before that is for example um, That is, for example, if you have a key, you rotate it into the lock, then it might be that only one of the, the disks makes sound. So what you want to do, and how they solve this in other, um, how they solve this in other uh, lock openings, like safe cracking, there they push put the wheels at a certain position and then only manipulate one of these uh, one of the elements at the same time so that allows you to um, differentiate between is this uh, wi which of the uh, elements is making making the sound or is uh, giving me the reading I didn't get as far uh, with this lock, but I definitely like uh, that uh, 3D printing worked in the end, which was already uh, weeks of effort. So the theoretical attack, uh, decoding it by sound, um, it might be possible in a perfect world. Uh, and if someone wants to continue the research, uh, then please, uh, please go for it. I cannot share the um, 3D print files. Uh, I cannot share them uh, publicly. 
Uh, but if someone is willing to put in the effort and willing to continue the research, then they can share these files there. And this is just simple, like this system has not been out there for that long, <laughs> like uh, currently only a year or something. And it's, I think it's uh, a bit unfair to a lock manufacturer to just uh, put it out there. So this is the uh, next lock, <laughs> uh, but let's just <laughs> appreciate uh, the picture for a second. <laughs> Yes, this is the um, Cromer protector. It's uh, quite a, a legend in the lock picking uh, world. It's um, the Cromer company has made this lock and variations of this lock for um, over 100 years, uh, 125 years to be exact. And they have really stopped stop doing this uh, for already over 10 years. And of this lock, uh, they have made around, uh, well, just over uh, six, 650,000 uh, locks. And that is uh, retracted, and it's, um, or I would say, uh, a friend of mine uh, tracked this. And uh, he figured out that it was um, quite a steady. <laughs> over, over 125 years, it was quite a steady. Uh, stream, something like uh, 500 locks a year. So that's uh, quite a nice one that uh, will keep someone uh, employed for a very long time. <laughs> but what's, um, what's so special about this lock? It has a um, unpickable <laughs> um, uh, idea, feeling, uh, vibe to it. There are multiple people that have uh, shared their, their ideas about uh, the lock. The top two are uh, good friends, Ayako from uh, Finland and Safini from the UK. Uh, these are definitely worth a, wa a watch if you want to, uh, want to know more about it. But just to um, do a small summary of it all the lock is quite complex like it has a lot of moving moving elements uh, we call them uh, wafers and uh, how they got to be so precise is you have these uh, wafers and they made a key to fit this lock they made the wafers oversize turn the key into the lock <laughs> then spin it up in a lathe and then just slowly turn it down to the correct dimension. That is definitely the way to go if you want to make uh, this well-made locks um, hundreds of years ago. And what makes this lock special is it, you cannot put torque on the uh, cylinder, or not at least not very well. And now I just have this lock um, here uh, on the desk, but just imagine it being in a wall, uh, in a door this big. Uh, after the talk, uh, please come forward and see uh, what the lock um, is. It's uh, certainly uh, well made. It's hard to hard to torque, and uh, even if you put torque on the lock, uh, like I did here. Uh, with this uh, chick. Even then, you need to have a lot of force uh, to put um, a lot of force to even get your first uh, binding uh, wafer. Uh, this chick uh, was made uh, using an old uh, scale, uh, which I use a strain gauge of, and I'm turning the lock from the uh, from the backside. <laughs> So it is um, cheating in the sense that this would never work uh, on a real thing. 
but I would always say in practice, in experimenting, do whatever it takes <laughs> to, to make it work and then later figure out how you can um, optimize. <laughs> So what I wanted to understand of this lock is how does the key uh, interact uh, with the wafers? These keys are, are quite difficult to measure, uh, so I uh, tried to try a few things, and one of them is to make a cast. This is just um, silicon molding. It's uh, I believe this stuff is sold for uh, a cake decoration. So you can make a mold of something and then pour in hot chocolate and then get something uh, that resembles the shape that you put in there. And just to demonstrate that it works uh, quite well as a key, I drilled in a hole and I uh, rotated it in the cylinder. Of these keys, I made then thin slices. I just used a hacksaw and sandpaper. And if I would do this again, I would definitely put it into a mini mill, like a proxon or something, and to also keep track <laughs> of where they belong. <laughs> like, do you have the top or the bottom? Is it how is it rotated? It was uh, it was nice. Then I asked uh, Johan uh, to to help me uh, digitize uh, these locks, and we ended up with quite nice uh, nice images, and I used them to create an OpenSketch project again. Like I quite like this program; it's definitely not uh, not an inventor, uh, but it works with how my brain works because it's just uh, pieces of code to describe <laughs> the shape of something, and uh, I like it. But now I can create uh, digital, uh, digital keys, but there was still an issue with getting the key into from the physical world <laughs> into the virtual world. And one solution was to build um, a jig again, in this case, it's a um, key decoder. It's a measuring tool, which I can use uh, to uh, measure uh, the elements of the key and hopefully then uh, digitize it. So there are definitely a few um, assumptions here. <laughs> it's like, uh, I don't have a digital copy of your key, I have a... Um, I have your key measured with the chick, then the chick and key generator are the same program. So if my key generator is correct, <laughs> then it should be a digital version um, of the uh, of the key. I built a few of these uh, in the real world. <laughs> uh, this is just a two millimeter uh, Delrin, and I use the um, hackerspace bit layer uh, laser cutter for this. And what I can uh, definitely recommend if you're doing anything that is uh, needs to be really precise, uh, if it just needs to be within uh, tens of millimeters, to claim <laughs> the laser for, uh, for a day or so. Uh, just start at a moment when nobody is around, <laughs> like uh, nine o'clock Monday morning. And just start uh, doing whatever you need to do to calibrate uh, the machine, to to measure the width of the laser, to uh, calibrate the beds, uh, those type of things. And all of these ended up to be uh, within a tenth of a millimeter. And those I kept uh, apart, the ones that are uh, nice, I gave to friends for them to measure their own keys and to help this project uh, progress. One thing about uh, this chick that I didn't mention, there are so many cutouts <laughs> because I don't know what they need to be. So 
This would allow me to measure the key within a tenth of a millimeter by just comparing shapes. But after we have compared, let's say, 10 keys, 100 keys, then we might be able to say, oh, half of these we don't need. We only need a very small subsection. And of course, the optimal goal would be to get from a serial number to a virtual key to a real key. Uh, but that is uh, that's going to be hard because these logs uh, have been out there. Uh, there are still uh, thousands of them, but they are not uh, definitely not cheap logs. Again, we have um, scans of the wafers. Uh, this I just did with a flatbed scanner. Um, even though it says 600 dpi, uh, don't 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 assume uh, measure. Just have a few calibration pieces there, and then you can get uh, quite nice scans. And then these are uh, digitized again with the help of. Uh, <laughs> of Johan. And what is uh, interesting here is uh, then I imported them in my program and it was uh, complaining that the files were too large because these are drawn at a kilometer scale uh, because he is a civil engineer. <laughs> but uh, scaling them worked quite well and we got it to work uh, in the end. With this, I also digitized uh, the lock and I made a few versions in the real world to see uh, whether or not this would work. There's all pieces of plastic, uh, all pieces of wood, and there's one right here <laughs> from acrylic. This one doesn't have springs, so it doesn't work as a, uh, as a real lock, but it is definitely still a nice uh, lock uh, to play around with. This is a bit where my project, um, where I didn't know anymore where to take this uh, this project. So I have a digital lock, I have uh, digital keys. I can try to fit them in there. But what I wanted to do actually is to figure out um, how do these pieces interact with, how do the key pieces interact with the uh, lock pieces, and then see if for, from pictures or from other information can I figure out um, how this actually works and to give some uh, insight. <coughs> this was one um, insight I was quite um, puzzled about because I fitted the pieces and I was like, okay, but there is a gap right there and it's, uh, it's even uh, almost half a millimeter, that is uh, way too much. But this told me quite a lot about, um, about the, how the lock functions. Because it is spring-loaded, it doesn't need two points of contact uh, with the key at the same time. It only needs a uh, one. And <laughs> it also showed me that most of the key is actually just decorative. But then trying to figure out which parts are decorative, that's going to be uh, the challenge. Just to confirm, um, I assembled a lock, turned the key, and measured this uh, tiny, tiny gap. And a tiny gap is about uh, 0 0.4 uh, millimeters. So the, um, <laughs> the files are almost uh, pixel uh, perfect, and I'm quite, uh, quite happy with them. But there's definitely still <laughs> some work to get from the physical world uh, to, the, uh, to the digital world, and then uh, back again. Like I have not 3D printed uh, these keys yet. I'm trying to experiment some with um, metal 3D printing, and I found a few interesting ones. Uh, the the latest one I have not played with, but I want to is 
uh, copper infused PLA, and then you can use a sintering to get real metal pieces. And I'm really looking forward to using that. I also have an outstanding order uh, with uh, China to make me some, uh, I think that's um, those metal powders that they, that they um, weld together with the laser. Uh, but they are complaining about the size, like they don't like, even though this is quite a big key, the, um, the wall thickness is uh, not, not what they, they are used to. Usually they are building bigger things. So I want to leave this one um, with this slide. Uh, we still have one more uh, impressioning uh, workshop uh, at uh, two o'clock in the, I think it's Alfred, Alfred Nobel. Um, yes, that was it. <laughs> Are questions? there any questions? Please wait. That's cool that we have a microphone. Cool. Mm. Did you consider other techniques like using LiDAR to scan the hole? To use LiDAR inside of the lock, that would be a <laughs> very cool technique, yes. Uh, I've not considered it yet. Um, if you can help me figure out uh, small enough sensors, uh, then I'm definitely uh, looking forward to using it. Okay. Hi, I know you said you didn't get too far into the sound analysis, but I was just wondering if you really uh, uh, played around, uh, what kind of sample rates you thought might be useful, like 22 kilohertz, 44, and what kind of microphones did you play with initially uh, in terms of quality, or did you play with a variety of ones? Um, so, so to understand, you're asking about the sample rates, about the quality? Yeah, like, I mean, um, 22 kilohertz is the common sample rate, 44 kilohertz, 48 kilohertz. Yes, uh, this is just audio. Um, I just used a normal USB deck, uh, ADC and deck. Uh, I started there. Um, a few things that I optimized is it's a, a pH, pHO. Yes, it's a pHO element. And usually people <laughs> just plug them into their recorder and it's, it's, it's fine. I, I like to have a little bit more control o over it. I'm an electrical engineer. I'm like, okay, but this is a mega, uh, mega ohm, uh, but my computer doesn't like uh, that as an impedance. It's also might be kilovolts uh, for the small durations. So you need an impedance matcher. So I built a custom one uh, from a design I found uh, on the internet. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do you listen to one uh, pin at a time or how does listening to the key work? Uh, listening to the key as the paper. No, as your exploit. As your exploit. Do you make a blank with just one bump and listen to the pin or do you listen to all the pins at once? Uh, because it's a statistical uh, analysis, it should be possible to do all of them at once, but you just vary your, your input. I also made a set which has one bump. Cool, thank you. Okay, thank you all for uh, listening. <laughs>